Good evening. Good evening. As you can tell by the new pyramids, we have a new season of the church here. We have begun the green season, and uh, if we have any altar guild members here, I know we have at least one. Um, we're not changing these banners again until I think Reformation Day. So yay for the altar guild anyway. Uh, uh, let's see, what else? We have a few announcements we have to get to before we get started. Uh, the elders will be meeting uh, next Monday night at 6 o'clock, and after that the church council meets at 7 o'clock. Uh, we had Bible study this morning at, at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, we didn't have a lot of people there, but I assume that's because word hadn't gotten out or people didn't know about it. So uh, we will continue to meet at 10 o'clock uh, on Wednesday mornings. Uh, and we decided today, the people that were there, that the best idea is probably just to study uh, the Bible studies that are in the Good News magazine. Uh, so next week we will, t we will begin talking about the devil and who he is and what he does and how God, uh, through his son Jesus Christ, protects us from the devil. So that, that is an interesting study and I hope that you'll be able to join us next Wednesday. Uh, we talked about an evening Bible study, but again, I'm waiting for you to contact me and let me know when would be the best night to do that. Uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, uh, if we do it every week, week uh, won't work because we've got Monday night meetings and sometimes a Tuesday night meeting, but we could do it once a month on a Monday or a Tuesday. Uh, we could do it every week on Thursday um, or we could do Sunday nights, but that's up to you guys. You have to be the ones to kind of get together, talk with one another and decide when you want to have that. Uh, confirmation pictures are in. I don't know that we have anybody here who has a kid in confirmation class, uh, maybe grandchildren, uh, but if your child or grandchild order any pictures, please pick those up in the church office. There will not be church next Wednesday. Okay, I think most people know that, but not everybody, because even one of the elders was asking in a, in a text chain with other elders, oh, I thought we decided to have the service, and the decision was made not to have the service next Wednesday because of Flag Day, in case some of you weren't aware of that. Uh, so no service next Wednesday. Next Sunday, not this upcoming Sunday, but the following Sunday, Kevin's going to be filling in for me uh, as preacher. So... Uh, uh, we are grateful to Kevin for his ability to do that. The St. Mark's men's group, such as it is, is having a cookout at 6 o'clock uh, on Tuesday, July 13th. Quite a ways off, over a month away. But uh, we want to get a men's group going, and that seems like a really good way of doing it. Uh, that's a Tuesday night. Hopefully that will work in your schedule. We'll have food, obviously, Bible study, yard games, all kinds of different activities to give you something to do. Uh, so hopefully you will be able to make it. Our order of service tonight is Divine Service Setting 1, uh, which we do celebrate our Lord's Supper. Our opening hymn is hymn 817, Earth and All Stars. May God bless our worship.
we make our beginning by remembering our baptisms with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment now for silent reflection on God's word and on our own sinful lives. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro for today comes from Psalm 119, and it is printed out for you in the bulletin so that we may read it now responsively. You have dealt well with your servant. O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like that, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. We continue now by singing the Kyrie, which is on page 152. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose never failing providence sets in order all things, both in heaven and on earth, we ask that you would put away from us all things hurtful and give to us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for tonight comes from the prophet Hosea, chapter 5, and continuing on into chapter 6. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. His will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, chapter 4. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. We rise now and join together in singing the Alleluia on page 156. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now turn in our hymnals to page 159 and join together in confessing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. We continue now by singing our sermon hymn, O God, Word of God Incarnate, Hymn 523. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The psalm of the day for today is from Psalm 119. The Old Testament reading for today is from Hosea 5. And both of them have the same message for God's people, that we should welcome the challenges to our faith that come, because they are the means by which our faith grows. A man of great faith once said, quote, God delights to increase the faith of his children. Instead of wanting victory without trials and patience with no effort to exercise it, we ought to recognize that trials, obstacles, difficulties, and yes, even defeats are the very food of our faith. Close quote. As we enter into the green season of the church year, that's a great thing for us to remember. Although this is the time of year for us to express the living faith that God seeks to grow in us, we need to remember also how he often chooses to grow it. 
It's not simply by reading his word or hearing it preached. Neither is it grown only by coming to the Lord's table, which you'll do in a few moments, and receiving our Lord's body and blood. God also sometimes uses the various hardships of our lives to bring us into deeper and closer relationships with himself. The scriptures are full of examples where faith is described as the result of challenges and difficulties. Romans 5 uh, produces one of those verses. In it, Paul said, We rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Now, of course, there are actually two kinds of faith that are described in the Bible. The first isn't really faith at all. Instead, it's more of a general knowledge of all the good things that God has done. And it's that kind of faith that James wrote about in the second chapter of his letter to the Christian church. He said that even Satan has that kind of faith, which, simply put, doesn't save anyone. In fact, it doesn't do anything. It's like the child who's stuck on the upper floors of a burning building, who knows that his father will catch him if only he will jump. Now, all of that may be true, but unless he actually jumps, that's not faith. The faith that saves is the kind that the boy has who actually jumps out the window into the strong waiting arms of his father below. Many of you will remember Gary Erickson, uh, who used to be a member of our church. He once told me about a time in Hawaii uh, when uh, he was relaxing with his family, and all of a sudden the, the warnings and the sirens were going off. He thought he was going to die. So what did he do? He went down to the beach with his family to pray and to wait for the bombs to hit. Thankfully, it was a false alarm, and there was really no danger, but he didn't know that at the time. But that's the kind of faith that Paul was talking about in today's epistle reading. In it, Paul said things like, The promise to Abraham and his offspring did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And that's why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only the adherents of the law, but also the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This faith that Paul wrote about is unshakable in its trust of God's promises. It knows that God is good and that he is merciful, and above all else, he is faithful to his word. So if God promised Abraham and his righteous descendants that they would be the inheritors of Christ's uh, the riches of Christ's grace, then that's what they were. And that means that a person is justified in the eyes of God by the faith that's in their heart. To be filled with true faith is to be fully righteous in the eyes of God. As Martin Luther was quoted as saying, the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls is the doctrine of justification. That's why we in the LCMS put such an emphasis on that doctrine. Because it is possible, even likely at times, to get confused by the people in the pews, and the distinction between law and gospel is not so clear. That's why we, as Lutheran pastors, work so hard to make that distinction obvious. Unfortunately, not everybody has a Lutheran pastor. In fact, most folks don't even have a Christian pastor. The Chicago radio station WMBI sent out one of their roving reporters to ask this question and see what people would say. The question is, uh, the reason I think I'm going to heaven is... dot, dot, dot. And the people were asked to answer the question. Some said, because I obey the golden rule. Others had a variation of that and said, because I love my neighbors. Still others gave answers like, because I'm good, because I pay my bills. Some even said, because I go to church. But do you see what's wrong with all of those answers? They're all law. They're all legalistic reasons for something that can't be earned by any attempt at obedience. 
no one is able to keep the law. For if anyone breaks even the smallest, most insignificant aspect of it, they've broken all of it. As James said again in the second chapter of his letter, the only thing that the law can do is condemn us. It cannot justify us. And yet there are all kinds of Christian denominations out there that will claim in one way or another that we're saved by the good works that we do. Now, they may put it in different words, of course, but that's still the bottom line for them. They make salvation conditional, making it based on a person's willingness and their ability to pay for their own sins. Luther, on the other hand, along with the other reformers, spent a lot of time in the 1500s working to refute that false and ungodly teaching. There once was a young boy who fell down into a deep well, and the walls of the well were sheer and impossible for anyone to climb. The only way out was for someone else to come down and rescue him. So the boy cried out for help for hours. Finally, someone passing by heard him and threw down a rope. But what the boy said was, the rope's not long enough. I can't reach it. That's how it is for us. The rope just isn't long enough. And even if it were longer, we are too weak to use it. We cannot, by our own reason or strength, believe in our Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. We need someone to come down into the well where we are and raise us up out of it. And that is what Christ Jesus has done for us. He came down to our world and he dwelt among us for over 30 years. Then it was time for him to finish the work that he was sent here to do. So he began to teach and to heal and most of all to forgive the sins of people who were brought to him. And all of those things were, were the fulfillment of God's ancient promises. That someday he would, God is, God that is, would come back and be the shepherd of his people once more. Except this time he would dwell among them in the flesh. And in the end, he would bring his children home with him. That's what Jesus did. By dying in our place and then rising again for our justification. In fact, after that, he didn't ascend right away. He continued to make the rounds of the earth for 40 more days, proving to many different people that he truly had risen from the dead. Only then did he ascend back to the Father. Now, normally that would be an impossible thing for anyone to do, but Christ did it. And because he did, we all have God's mercy and grace and eternal life to look forward to. That's what the gospel does. It takes the things that are Christ's and gives them to us. To him belongs glory and honor and holiness. He was and he is perfect which is why he alone was able to earn his deserved place at his Father's right hand. But because we've been baptized into Christ, now all of those things belong to us. Meanwhile, Jesus took our sinfulness, our rebelliousness, our wickedness, and made it his own. And then he put all of those things to death on the cross once and for all. This is the great exchange that we talk about in church all the time. Jesus suffered and died for the things that we did, yet we are exalted and praised for the things he did. When Luther was called to the Diet of Worms in 1519 to defend his teachings, he said, quote, everything that Christ has is ours, graciously bestowed on us unworthy people out of God's sheer mercy although we have deserved wrath and condemnation in hell. Then Luther added, through faith in Christ, Christ's righteousness, even he himself has become ours. When God promised Abraham that he would be a father, even though he was old and his wife Sarah was well past her childbearing years, Abraham believed it. And it was counted to him as righteousness. He not only believed God's promises, he was saved by his faith in them. As it said in the text, Abraham was fully convinced that God could do what he said he would do. And we should be fully convinced of that as well, because what God has said, he will do. Now, God hasn't promised that any of us will have long, joyful lives. 
In fact, we've all known children who died at a relatively young age. But what God has promised to us is that he will be with us through whatever trials and tribulations may come. He'll always bless us and keep us in his tender care. And best of all, he will take us to our true home in heaven when our time on earth is done. That's why Jesus came down, not only to the earth and to all people, but specifically for sinners and tax collectors. They were burdened with the requirements of the law, which most of them knew they had not kept. But rather than offering them help or advice, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law condemned them and wondered why Jesus didn't do the same. But Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but only those who are sick. Then he added, I came to call the righteous, not the righteous, sorry, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The righteous that Jesus mentioned were not righteous in God's eyes, only in their own. They didn't think they needed Jesus. That's why they can call themselves righteous. That's why they rejected Jesus. But there were many who did realize that they needed Christ. And to them, Jesus was a heroic redeemer. They were great sinners, yes. But Jesus Christ is an even greater Savior. And the ones who know that are the ones that Paul was talking about when he wrote, It will be counted to us as righteousness if we believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead for our justification. Once this faith has been counted to us as righteousness, though, that's not the end. Instead, it's just the beginning of our earthly vocations. Now that we know what Christ Jesus has done for us, we are supposed to go and tell others about it. As Luther wrote, quote, Oh, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It is impossible for it not to be doing good works incessantly. It does not ask whether good works are to be done, but before the question is asked, it has already done them and is constantly doing them. Dear friends in Christ, you are saved by God's grace through faith, and that is great. But it's not the end. It's just the beginning. So go forth now and make Christ crucified known to all people. Christ died. Christ rose. Christ is coming again. So to him be all honor, glory, and praise now and forevermore. Amen. At this time, our offerings will be collected. Please use this time to fill out the attendance pad. together and singing the offertory which begins at the bottom of page 159.
we continue now with the prayers of the church. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you for the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. What he did during his time on earth was a great gift and blessing to us, your people. May we continually rejoice in all that he did and heed his great command to go and make disciples of all nations by teaching them to obey all that you have said. As we seek to fulfill that command, may you bless our efforts and cause us to be faithful instruments in your benevolent hands. O Lord, we ask that you would grant help, healing, comfort, and strength to those we lift up to you today, including Beth, Elizabeth, Ruth, Michelle, Stephen, Trevor, Ron and Rosemary, Lydia, Madeline, Sarah, Connie, Jerry, Adam, Marcel, Annette, Brad, Denny, Tracy, Jan and Carol, and Melody. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the grace, peace, and hope that you pledged to us when you adopted us as your children in the waters of baptism. We especially rejoice with those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Beatrice, Adelie, Michael, Ethan, Jack, Amber, Darlene, Susan, Wyatt, and Matthew. May they and all of us know and rejoice in the gifts of grace that you poured out on us that day. Almighty God, because everything in this world is under your loving care, we ask that you would protect your people from all sickness and evil, that you would help those who are struggling financially and heal those who have been harmed by physical or emotional violence, that you would have mercy on those who have been devastated by natural disasters and bless those in prisons and orphanages. May you also sustain those who risk their lives for the good of their neighbors. May you continually work good in all things as you have promised to do and give us those things that you know we need. Finally, Lord, we ask that you would bless the leaders of your church on earth, including Matt, our synodical president, Brady, our district president, Don, our circuit visitor, and all the leaders of St. Mark's who serve us in a variety of ways. May your spirit continually rest upon them and work through them so that they may be enabled to serve this congregation faithfully and carry out the vocations you've called them to do. All of these things and all the things that are on our hearts and minds this night. We lift them all up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament, which begins on page 160. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing... Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. together in singing the post-communion canticle, thank the Lord and sing his praise, the bottom of page 164. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Please be seated for the singing of our closing hymn, We Walk by Faith, Not by Sight, Hymn 720.